My name is Chris Dixon. I'm a general partner at Andreessen Horowitz, and I am the founder and managing partner of our crypto fund. I have worked on worked in the internet business for my entire career for about 25 years. I started off as a software engineer, and then I became an entrepreneur. My first company was a security company, which was acquired by McAfee, the large security provider. My second company was an AI company, which was acquired by eBay. I also uh, started angel investing about in 2006, invested in a, a bunch of prominent internet startups like Pinterest and Stripe, Kickstarter. I joined Andreessen Horowitz in 2013. I led our investment in Coinbase in 2013. Oculus, the VR company that Meta acquired about five years ago, started our crypto fund practice, which I lead today. So my book is called Read, Write, Own, and it's about the potential of, of blockchain and crypto technology. I, you know, over the years have had many conversations with people uh, about the value and promise of blockchains. And in those course of those conversations, I often found that that it was a challenge to explain it all in a, in a single meeting because there was kind of prior knowledge required. I would say is sort of common knowledge among internet entrepreneurs, but not common knowledge more broadly. And so in my book, what I do is sort of, there's roughly three sections to my, three parts to my book. And the first part goes through the history of the internet and kind of gives the foundations, kind of the prerequisite knowledge. And that basically the argument of the first third of the book is that um, the most important internet services are networks. So if you think about Facebook and Uber and WhatsApp, these are networks. And a network means they're services that connect people together. And networks have what are called network effects, which means that the more people that use them, the more valuable they get. And one consequence of that is that as some of these services have gotten very big, um, they've gotten very, very powerful. As a result, I think we're at a serious risk right now of uh, ending up with an internet that is really just sort of four or five large internet companies like Google and Amazon and Apple and Facebook and so forth, which I think would be a bad outcome for startups and for society more generally. The promise of the internet initially was to be a decentralized network that returned power and money to the users of the network instead of sort of central intermediaries the way that prior media industries looked. If you think about, you know, at least in the United States, like TV and radio and all the other kind of media businesses were very centralized. There were a few big channels that kind of controlled everything, controlled all the money. And the internet, when I got involved, and I think a lot of people in the 90s got involved, it was, what was very exciting about it, it, it would shift the money flow and the power back to the edges of the network. And that, I think that happened for somewhat for the 90s, but then in the, in the 2000s, a lot of that kind of started to reconsolidate. And you fast forward to today and the, you know, the top five tech companies account for 50% of the NASDAQ 100 market capitalization. The top five tech companies account for, it's like 95% plus of the traffic and the money made on the internet. And all, by all trends, that will continue to consolidate. I, you know, I think artificial intelligence, what's happening there is very exciting, although I think left unchecked, it will even further accelerate that consolidation because it's a technology that rewards companies with large pools of capital and data and compute, which the large incumbents do. And so then in the in the second part of my book, I argue that the best kind of countermeasure, the best way to counter this consolidation is a new wave of internet services built on top of blockchains. To kind of think of the simple way to think about a blockchain-based internet service is it's a service that removes the gatekeepers and the toll keepers. If you look at Facebook and Uber and Amazon, all these services, YouTube, Twitter, um, one of the key features is that money flows through these systems, whether it's money paid for by advertisers or through commerce, people sending money. Those services have what are called take rates, and take rates it's a term, an internet term, that means the percentage of the money that flows through the network that goes to the owner of the network. Internet services, they have very high take rates. So they, they range typically, and I go through it in detail in the book, from 50 to 100%. Most of the money flowing through these systems go to these service providers. They also have the, all the control of the network. They decide who gets access to the network, who gets deplatformed. They decide how the algorithm works. They often change the rules. If you have a link, if you do this, if you have this type of content, you get promoted, you get demoted. These algorithms are opaque. They don't, you know, they're controlled by these companies. The users and creators and all the other people that depend on these networks live and die by the whims of these centralized providers. So the key feature of blockchains is you can build new internet services, and those services can be anything we use on the internet today. They can be social networks, they can be games, they can be marketplaces, they can be AI services, but they're internet services where there is no gatekeeper and there is no toll. -keeper.
the service is controlled by the users, the money floats to the users. And then the last third of the book, I take those kind of concepts and I apply them to, I, I chose seven areas, sort of specific applications, and, and try to kind of imagine how the future might look once, you know, once entrepreneurs build these services. So what I hope it is, the book is, you know, it's a comprehensive guide written in a very kind of plain English way, plain, you know, kind of a straightforward way for non-technical people to get a full kind of understanding of how the internet works, the history of the internet, and the promise of blockchains and why I'm excited about them, why entrepreneurs are excited about them. And I, look, I also wrote it for policymakers. So when the internet started in the 90s, most internet services were what we call kind of the technologies, technologists call read only, meaning you'd go to a website and you'd consume information. And so you'd sort of go to a website and it would look, back then they kind of looked like magazines or brochures. And for the most part, you didn't have things like social media in the 90s. And then there was a movement called, at the time, in the, in the 2000s, I was part of this movement. It was called Web2. It was also called the Read Write Movement. It was, there were conferences called the Read Write Conferences. There were blogs called Read Write, Read Write Web and things. The con kind of the motivating concept behind that movement was the internet can be more than it is today. It can be more than sort of a passive consumption, consumptive medium. And, and specifically what that meant is we can build social media, what we call social media today. So we can build websites and services where instead of you just going and reading content that an editor wrote, you can submit content. So you can build Facebook and Twitter where you can post content and read that content, right? That was the Web2 movement. It was about making the internet a full kind of participatory medium, allowing people to not only read, i.e. consume information, but also write, i.e. publish information. That's not my idea, that's an old concept. The read-write web was a widespread term in the 2000s. What I see it as the potential of blockchains is to introduce a, a new element, kind of a new capability of the internet, which is own, which is ownership. So blockchains are, you know, powerful inventions that can do many things. I refer to them as kind of a new kind, new class of, of computer that exists on the internet, sort of cloud-based computers. They can do many things, but one of the key things they can do is they can enable digital ownership. And so you think about something like Bitcoin, one of the interesting properties of a Bitcoin is that you, you know, if you have the private key, if you, if you have the code for a Bitcoin, you own that Bitcoin in a way that you don't own, for example, your data on Twitter and Facebook. So like I have a following on Twitter and I built it up over many years, but if the owners of Twitter decide they want to take that away tomorrow, they can't. So in that sense, I don't own that. And there have been many cases of this, by the way, where people have lost their accounts and lost their data, or whether it's objects in a game or stuff on social media. In the existing dominant paradigm of the internet, there is no kind of concept of user ownership. So you think about Bitcoin, this is, this is the first case in which 15 years ago, you had this new idea, which is it's a digital service, but the user owns that Bitcoin. And what's happened since the advent of Bitcoin is that technologists have generalized that concept of ownership. And so, for example, an NFT, the idea with NFT is, is sort of a generalization of that where you can own a piece of art, you can own a game object, you can own an NFT that represents a social media handle. In the new model, in the blockchain model, users can own things. And what that does is that shifts power back to the user. So if the user can own something, then it can't be taken away. And so just to give you the example of social media, if I own my handle and I own my followers, if I don't like what the service is doing, I can take that handle and take those followers and switch. And I can go to a different service. In the kind of the new blockchain paradigm, I can own that name. I can own my follower list. I can own my data. I can own a, a set of data that I contribute to an AI algorithm. In the existing dominant paradigm, the only kind of things that can own things on the internet are services, are the kind of the companies behind it, these services. Just in the same way that, you know, you think about email, so the early internet protocols like email had this feature as well. So, you know, one of the reasons that newsletters have become popular again, and you see a lot of journalists, for example, leaving media companies and starting a newsletter, and they use services like Substack. The reason that's popular is they like the fact that they own, when you have a newsletter, you own your email subscribers, you have their name. And if, you know, Substack, I believe, charges 10% or something, their take rate, if they change that or change the rules, you can just simply leave the service. And so with, you know, blockchain-based service, it's the same concept. And so ownership is a core concept. I mean, we're at, we're at a point now, right, and where, where the Web2 companies like, you know, Facebook are, have billions of users. And, you know, blockchain services, well, if you, if you count, like, sort of, 
the number of people that own crypto, it's in the hundreds of millions, but the number of people that use internet services like this new wave of games and social media, it's in the tens of millions, but I see, which is a lot of people, but it's a, actually a small percentage of internet users. So we're still in a relatively early stage of this development. I think that's due to a few things. Like one is the infrastructure, sort of the underlying infrastructure to use these services is still a little bit, it's taken some time to get it to be performant, uh, low cost, high quality user experiences. I think we've just only recently gotten to that point where you can like, for example, play a blockchain based crypto game and it feels kind of like a like a non-blockchain game and, and it's sort of the whole user experience and the, and the expenses and everything else. So we're still relatively early in that process. I, I hope and I, I think in the next couple of years we'll see some really interesting kind of development there. Yeah, one of the concepts I talk about in my book is that I, I argue that there's two cultures, two different cultures that are excited about blockchains. I call one the casino and one the computer. And the casino are people who are more excited about the kind of speculative aspects of taking a token, meme coins, you know, buying and selling things, sort of things like, you know, people that used FTX um, and other kinds of services like that. And then there's the computer, which I see myself as part of, which is the people that are much more interested in this kind of broader vision of building a new wave of internet services um, that are, you know, that, that enable digital ownership, that have low take rates that are owned and operated by users. And so, and, and that's what we try to promote and invest in is the kind of computer side of things. I think the casino side, by the way, is just gotten a lot more attention and has, I think, negatively shaped the perception of the broader space, and that's unfortunate. What I'm hoping is that we'll have smart policy and regulatory frameworks that really tamp down on the casino stuff and allow for the computer stuff. I think there's been really bad uh, policy decisions made, especially in the United States in the last couple of years, that have actually encouraged the casino behavior. There were more meme coins created last month than there were 500,000 created, something like that last month, so far more than any time in history. So the casino behavior is probably at an all-time high. And meanwhile, the regulatory policy has actually um, significantly stifled the computer, the, the productive behavior, which is exactly the opposite of what a smart policy would do. I'm hoping that will change. I think there's a lot of good signs. So in terms of identifying the founders, look, I mean, we spent a lot of time with the founders. Um, it's, it hopefully becomes pretty clear when you're talking to them, like, what is their mission? Is their mission to build like a really useful internet service over the long term? Or is their mission to kind of run a get rich quick scheme? And, you know, we try to invest in the former and avoid the latter. I, I, like, I think first and foremost, this is a policy failure. This is a regulatory failure. We've been calling for regulation for a long time. It's the role of governments and regulators to eliminate the scams without eliminating the productive application. You know, all technologies can be used for good and bad. A, a hammer can be used to you know, build a house and it can be used to destroy a house, right? A fertilizer can be used to grow crops and it can be used to build explosives. AI can be used for cheating and scams, creating bioweapons, or it can be used for enhancing human creativity and flourishing. Blockchains can be used for scams, or they can be used for um, productive, you know, new wave of internet services that, you know, shift money and power back to internet users. The way that we make sure that a technology is used for good and not for bad is by putting rules around it. And so I think it's a mistake to conflate, to confuse specific applications of a technology with the technology itself. And what I try to do in Read, Write, Own is I try to fully describe the productive use of blockchains. It's a mistake to jump from there were bad uses of this technology to therefore that technology is bad. The technology itself is neutral. It's up to people and governments to channel the potential of that technology in positive ways. So I think the value of writing, whether it's a blog post or a book, is a couple of things. One is, what I like to do is to try to kind of nudge entrepreneurs into, you know, like put out ideas that might help them and help accelerate their thinking and hopefully, you know, attract more people into the space, get them thinking about the technology kind of along the right way. And, you know, and hopefully that creates more interesting inbound entrepreneurs for us to speak to. And it lets the conversation that we have be much more sophisticated because they've already read a lot of stuff. I've hopefully read their stuff, they've read my stuff, and now we can jump to kind of the advanced conversation, right? Um, so it just saves a lot of time in that way. We hope to work with the very smartest people and the very smartest people always wanna read interesting stuff. And so it's just a way to kind of build a relationship, share knowledge, accelerate 
the development of the space. And look, I think crypto has had its challenges for sure. And specifically, you know, FTX in the US and I think Terra Luna in Korea, right? I mean, there've been a bunch of, there were a bunch of bad things that happened a couple of years ago. People that say it's dead, like I don't, I, mean, I don't agree. And I think that, I think that my experience has been that every interesting technology has gone through waves. I started my career when people said the internet was dead. I mean, I started in the, my first company in 2003 and four, I, I've found all the best opportunities in my career have been when people say something is dead. My experience has been there's lots of ups and downs. AI had its, up, its ups and downs. The internet has its ups and downs. Crypto's had its ups and downs. If you wait till things are up, you're going to be, you know, there's going to be a huge crowd doing the exact same thing you're doing. The way that you actually are successful, in my experience as an entrepreneur or investor, is you've got to have high conviction and, and be willing to bet on things through ups and downs. I'm excited to come to visit Korea soon for the first time. I've actually been reading a bunch of books on Korea. I've always been a big fan of Korean culture and Korean entrepreneurship. Well, I, I realize that there's been some challenging times around the, the crypto space in Korea, but I think it's a very high potential country, I think, for future entrepreneurship, for blockchain entrepreneurship. And we have a few investments there, and I am very excited to uh, get to know the country better and potentially invest more there. Thank you.